My name is Bruce Tchaikovsky. I'm the uh, Associate Director for Science here at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado. I'm also a professor in geological sciences here at CU, but for today's discussion, I'm the principal investigator of the MAVEN mission, which is the next spacecraft that we're going to launch to Mars. We're sitting here in front of a mock-up of the Mariner 6 and 7 spacecraft. Those flew to Mars in the late 1960s, about the time I was 14 years old, and we just have one on display here at last. But this is an example of the type of thing that we can do of building a spacecraft and sending it to another planet. I look at something like this and it just amazes me that we can build something this size, send it to another planet, it takes nine or 10 months to get there, and it can actually make measurements that have meaning to us and tell us something about the planet. The MAVEN spacecraft will be a little bit bigger than this. We've come a long way in the last 40 years, but it's the same idea of designing something that can survive for several years in order to get there, orbit, in our case, orbit Mars, take data, and send it back to the Earth. So back in the 1960s, we were just beginning to explore the solar system and send spacecraft to planets. Today, we know a lot more about Mars than we did then. We've sent many spacecraft that have orbited, that have landed, that have roved around on the surface. With MAVEN, we have specific questions that we want to answer. What is the nature of the climate today? How has that climate changed over time? How does the atmosphere interact with the environment around it? How does the solar wind, the solar energy that hits the planet affect the atmosphere and, and cause it to change over time? We see evidence that there had been liquid water on the surface in the past, and yet the atmosphere is cold and thin and dry today and incapable of supporting stable liquid water. One of the, the key questions about Mars is how has that climate changed? Why did it go from an early warm, wet environment to today's cold, dry environment? If you think about it, where did the water go? Where did the atmosphere go? There are two places it can go. One is all of that can go down into the subsurface. The CO2 from the atmosphere can form carbonate minerals. The water can percolate downward. But we don't see evidence for that. We don't see it at least in the abundance that would be required to explain where did that early atmosphere go. The other place it can go is up. It can go to the top of the atmosphere and be lost to space. It can be stripped away by the sun, by the solar wind. That's really what MAVEN is about, trying to understand the role that escape of the atmosphere to space has played in the changing climate on Mars. So MAVEN is going to measure the current state of the upper atmosphere, and, and the reason we're focusing on that is it's the top of the atmosphere that is the conduit through which gas has to travel to go from the bulk atmosphere to be lost to space. And we want to understand those processes. By looking at that, we're going to understand the history of the habitability of the planet. And when I say habitability, I mean by microbes. Even though MAVEN isn't about finding life, I have to admit that, that that's really the most important question. Was there ever life on Mars? Today, there's no water on the surface. Could there be life in the subsurface? We've identified places where we think life could have existed, but that doesn't tell us that it did exist. But really, it tells us about the possibility of life on planets elsewhere in our galaxy, elsewhere in the universe, because it tells us what controls the climate, what makes it possible for life to exist. That's one small step for man. And I remember two things in particular. The first is I was 14 years old when the first Apollo astronauts landed on the moon. And I was interested in space, and that was just such an exciting thing. I think that's one of the two things that really pushed me toward a career in space sciences. Just the sheer excitement, the human drama of doing something like that. Those are the words I can put on it now. Back then, it was just so cool to see it like that. The other thing that I remember when I was six years old was sitting in front of the TV watching the countdown on the first Mercury astronaut launch into space. Oh, 
flag uh, lift off and the clock has started. I, I didn't know the words for it, but I thought that was so incredibly exciting. Okay, and I was so angry at my mom for uh, making me turn off the TV so I could go to school. Uh, I thought the, the right thing would have, of course, been to stay home and watch the launch. Those things made such a big impression on me, first as a six or seven year old, then as a, a 13 or 14 year old, that I really think those are what pushed me in this career direction. When I was 12 or 13 years old and thinking about my path through school, I, hadn't, I had no clue where I was headed. I was always interested in science. Uh, in high school, that became uh, in, an interest in physics and an ability at math. And that led to, to college and graduate school. And I was lucky enough to find something that really excited me. I took a, an undergraduate college course in planetary science and said, that's it. That's what I want to do. I changed my major. By the end of that semester, I was working for the professor who taught the class. And I'm still doing the same sorts of things 35, 40 years later. If you're thinking about what path to head down, my advice is to find something that excites you. For me, it was studying the planets. Find the one thing that excites you and pursue it. You don't necessarily have to be good at math and physics. You don't have to be good at chemistry. But you have to find something that's exciting enough that you're willing to jump in and focus on it for a long time. As principal investigator, my role is to head the entire mission. I'm responsible for designing, implementing, carrying out the mission, and then getting the science from it. Now, I don't do that on my own. We have a whole management team and a project manager who oversees the day-to-day -day activities. We have a science team. We have people who really know how to build the spacecraft, the science instruments, and people who know what to do with the, the science data when it comes back. But my role is to be responsible for the science. Launch is my stomach is in my heart. My heart is in my stomach. I'm not quite sure which way it goes. Uh, in fact, last night I was up half the night with nightmares about what can happen at the launch. Because the launch is its the culmination of 10 years of work to get there and be on our way. But it's also the biggest possibility of failure. It's the, the riskiest time. Launch vehicles don't always work right. The vibration that you subject the spacecraft to, the high gravity forces as you accelerate off the planet, uh, all of these can damage the spacecraft. We design it, we test it to make sure it's not going to, but you never know what's gonna happen. So, so launch is the most exciting time and also the most frightening time. In fact, uh, at the time of launch, I know that I'm gonna be carrying a, an airplane air sickness bag with me because the odds that I'm going to be so nervous I'm going to be throwing up are really high. After we launch, it takes about 10 months to get to Mars. And the reason is Mars and Earth are in very different orbits. And in fact, we're sending the spacecraft from Earth. When it gets to Mars, it'll be on the far side of the sun. So it's in an orbit around the sun until it gets there. When we go into orbit around Mars, it actually takes us about five and a half weeks to commission the spacecraft. We have to get from our insertion orbit, from our capture orbit, into our final orbit, and that takes us about a week. Then we have to deploy the booms that hold some of the instruments. We have to test all of the instruments. We have to test the alignment of the spacecraft. All of this has to be done before we can begin making science measurements. We've actually got a really crowded schedule. You think, my god, how can you feel, fill uh, five and a half weeks? It's a really tight schedule. And people are going to be working incredibly hard to make sure we can succeed at it. Then we start the mission. The science mission, the primary science mission, runs for one Earth year, 12 months. But we thought we could answer the key questions we had posed about Mars and the driving changes of climate. After that, we're still in orbit around Mars, so we're going to continue to take science measurements. But we wouldn't have wanted to try to design for an 11-year mission, because that's a lot harder. We think we'll get there, but we design it for that one-year mission. I have such a fun job. I can't imagine 
anything that would be more exciting, more engaging than doing this. I'll tell you the truth. The day-to-day the -day activity of what I actually do can be incredibly tedious. The hours that I spend reading and replying to email, writing reports, writing documents, writing requirements are painful sometimes. But the 10% of the job, the 15% of actually getting to look at the data, of seeing, stepping back and seeing that we're sending a spacecraft to Mars, those are so exciting that it makes up for the rest of it. Is there anything left to explore about Mars? The most fundamental question about Mars, was there life, is there life, is one we haven't answered. These are questions that we, we have the capability to answer, but we just have to have the will to design and send the spacecraft to answer them. I'd like to see this happen over the next 10 to 20 years. Beyond that, we have the ability to send people to Mars. It's today's middle schoolers that have the possibility of being the first astronauts we send to Mars. All we need is the will to keep exploring the solar system around us.